What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Hidden Forces with me, Dimitri Kafinas. Today, we speak with one of the pioneers in the science of complexity, Brian Arthur. Dr. Arthur has long been associated with the Santa Fe Institute, having served on its board of trustees and its board of science. He has been described by Fortune magazine as one of the country's leading economic thinkers, and he is best known for his pioneering work on the operation of high technology markets. He is the author of numerous papers and books, including The Nature of Technology, What It Is and How It Evolves, and Complexity and the Economy, a collection of papers on economics and financial markets examined from the perspective of complexity theory. In this episode, we examine the emerging field of complexity. We look at its interdisciplinary history, a history born from the work of mathematicians, physicists, philosophers, ecologists, biologists, a field binded together not by its adherence to perfection, but by the imperfections of the natural world. This is going to be a discussion far from equilibrium. It's going to be messy. It's going to zig, it's going to zag. We're going to cover the booms and the busts of Joseph Schumpeter, the information-laden price signals of Friedrich Hayek, the chaotic orbits of Joseph Ford, the infinite fractals of Benoit Mandelbrot. We touch on information theory, cryptography, quantum potentiality, and dive deep into the waves that make markets and life so volatile. A volatility that is born of a universe whose countless mysteries we seek to understand. As always, you can gain access to reading lists put together by me ahead of every episode by visiting the show's website at hiddenforcespod.com. Lastly, if you are listening to this show on iTunes or Android, Make sure to subscribe. If you like the show, write us a review. And if you want a sneak peek into how the sausage is made, or for special storylines told through pictures and questions, then like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod. And now, time for this week's conversation. Professor, thank you so much for being on the program. I really, I really appreciate you waking up so early over there in Singapore. Glad to be here. <laughs> uh, so I was uh, I was saying to you before we started that uh, I uh, I do have some uh, some background in the field, informal. I mean, I studied it out of sheer curiosity, um, and uh, you know I, I, I'm familiar with with the work of people like uh, Edward Lorenz and uh, Stephen Smale and James York and Joseph Ford, and and then of course there are people within information theory, which I think. It was dovetails in this in some way. People like Shaitan and uh, Salamanov and uh, you know, and people like that. Um, and of course, there's there's Mandelbrot as well. Um, so, in fact, that kind of gets to to something that I wanted to say off the top, which is one of the things that really fascinates me and interests me about complexity theory and the and complexity science is the interdisciplinary aspect of the field. And so, it's also very rich. I find it as well. Um, so, I think. It would it would serve uh, me certainly and our audience as well best if uh, we started with an overview and really if you could if you could give us the um, sort of a, a historical context for complexity as a science as a theoretical framework for understanding the natural world for understanding the understanding the world as we know it um, how that sort of evolved over time again given the fact that this this is really a, a field of people coming in from different areas who's who were looking at their models and saying you know something's not right here and and uh, and we want to get to the bottom of this or the top <laughs> I guess well for three or four hundred years since the time of Galileo and Newton after that. There's been a, a real takeoff of science and the way it was conducted for several hundred years very, very successfully was to look at nature from the top down. So you look at something like an animal or a bunch of animals of the same species and then you can look at a single animal and you can look at organs within the animal and cells within the organs and so on, like taking the Swiss watch apart. And what science has done over many, many years is to take nature apart and look at its pieces and analyze how each piece works and uh, trying to figure out also how some of those pieces at a certain level work together. Uh, complexity uh, 
there's many meditation there's many many uh, definitions of complexity but complexity tends to go in the other direction it's asking if you have a bunch of pieces maybe affecting each other or influencing each other what how does the whole operate so imagine that the pieces or the entities we're looking at say are cars cars spaced out on a some sort of freeway in montana don't have much effect on each other, but if it's New Jersey where they're bunched up and very, very densely packed, then each individual car is reacting to its neighbor cars, and you've got patterns emerging. Traffic might be flowing pretty well. Some uh, animal runs out or somebody spills their coffee while they're driving and slows down as an automatic reaction, and maybe cars behind that slow down and further cars behind that, and suddenly a jam uh, emerges, a, a pattern forms. So we're looking always in complexity at patterns forming, and nearly always from the bottom up. If you have cells in the immune system, how do they form something we call immunity, uh, as a larger level pattern. With respect to uh, the history of science, and you and you mentioned Galileo, you mentioned um, this sort of Newtonian world, it seems, I think you were going to this world of component parts adding up in a linear way, um, and uh, and this sort of classical interpretation of of the world and and uh, methodology and and model. Can you expound a little bit on what that really me- means and, and sort of how that uh, how that works scientifically, how, so that people really are able to 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 understand where you're going with complexity and how it it differentiates. Sure. Um, yeah. So from the time of Newton on, people have been looking in finer and finer detail at nature and trying to figure out how these individual parts add up, you know, linearly and create something. And they made some simplifications along the way because really all we had to work with mostly was pencil and paper if we were doing theory. We were just trying to figure out what the simple mechanisms are. So a lot of the assumptions we made were that the world is somehow at equilibrium, that all the forces we're looking at in a given area, whether they're in geology or in biology, for that matter, in the economy, or all those forces are really well balanced, so nothing really new is happening. A bit like a spider's web. A spider's web has many, mm. many parts, and they're all mutually holding each other in balance. And if everything stayed the same, we could do the analysis, and we could write down equations for the system, and we could treat it as if it was kind of static, it wasn't going anywhere, and we could kind of hold it still while we took a snapshot of the whole thing and analyzed it and what, what, how the equilibrium balanced out, and you'd learn quite a lot from that. There were a lot of people in history, uh, people like uh, Henri Poincaré, uh, say in France, about 100 years ago or more, people were not that satisfied with this. But then if you said, well, hang on a moment, it's not a spider's web, it's little parts that are moving and affecting other parts that are moving, and everything's affecting everything else, and it may never settle down and may be always showing you quite new things, but there is no way to analyze that, to kind of hold it still uh, with pencil and paper. Or you couldn't easily write equations for, you know, a 100,000 things interacting and affecting each other. And then around the 1980s, early 1980s, we all got computers, We got what we call then desktop workstations. (laughs) I haven't heard the term in a while. Uh, We got laptops after that. We had supercomputers and so on. And people were able to take each element, a bit like cars in traffic, and assign each element its own little computer program. How was it going to react given what the others were doing? 
and then hit the return button and see how the whole system, all the little elements reacted to all the other elements in the system and what patterns might form and what those patterns might tell us. And sometimes, lo and behold, that settled down to the static equilibrium that traditionally sciences were interested in, and sometimes it didn't. Sometimes we saw new phenomena, sometimes new things would emerge that we hadn't thought of. But really it's a shift from looking at the world, we say in reductionist terms from the top down, and imagine everything holding everything else in an equilibrium where not much is changing at all, to looking at the world as alive. Everything's affecting everything, and in standard phrase, it's sort of one damn thing after another, uh, with uh, elements reacting to other elements. Some elements, if they're human beings, might be exploring, seeing if they can do better and changing. That changes the system, and so other elements need to change as well. Just to, to stamp that point home, uh, you mentioned equilibrium, which is which is such an important point because these models, um, and including in economics, which we're going to get into, relied on this notion of equilibrium. They also relied on on, uh, or rather, they sought simplicity. Yes. Which, um, of course, and they were they were highly deterministic. Um, and I suppose also, uh, complexity is not suggestive of a non-deterministic system, but rather one that's unpredictably deterministic. Um, uh, so, so there was essentially, just to frame this, uh, there was essentially a problem in the sense that these models were elegant, they worked very well, and for, and for many people, I should mention, they still seem, I mean, policymakers and uh, central bankers, uh, this is an area where uh, many of the academicians and the practitioners and the policymakers rely on these um, these these models that look at the world in equilibrium and seek out uh, a, a, pla- a place of stasis. They look to achieve uh, stability and that their goal uh, in policy is to so- somehow arrive at that point of equilibrium. And uh, from what I understand, having uh, you know uh, some sense of the history of the field of complexity science, it emerged out of this recognition that uh, this, that as much as we may w- wish to achieve a level of simplicity uh, in our models and and uh, and and uh, and we we like this idea of, of equilibrium that it didn't uh, match with reality. I also should say it's great that you bring up uh, 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 Henry uh, Poincaré. I always mispronounce his name, but one of my favorite quotes uh, of his ends with. Uh, Chance is only the measure of our ignorance, and uh, that sort of really uh, that quote was embedded in a lot of my understanding around uh, noise and uh, and randomness and the message and information uh, theory. Well, for many many situations, this equilibrium point of view, you know, where all the forces are balanced, if you want, that is quite appropriate, and that's what we teach. We teach students this from high school on, and we teach that in the universities and. I'd say 99% of science sees the world that way. For example, you might be looking at the Rocky Mountains or the Himalayas or, or some sort of geological formation, and under gravity, you know, these mountains um, are pushing down on the earth and the earth's pushing back on the mountains, and all of this is floating in some sort of magma on top of the earth, and all those forces are in balance. But occasionally, systems like that get out of balance, uh, possibly in California or in Japan or somewhere like that, and some of these forces trigger other forces that may trigger an earthquake. And then faults uh, move and forces propagate and other earthquakes may happen along the same fault are not too far from that fault. So you get these events triggering events, triggering other events and propagating across the system. That's the kind of thing, the propagation of changes that aren't in equilibrium, that's the kind of thing that interests complexity. And uh, and that, of course, happens, as, uh, the more interconnected a network, the more the, the, the propagation across that network. For sure. Complexity, we're always looking at interconnected things. 
quite often we're looking at networks, we're looking at things that are reacting to things. So in a way, the way I would define a complex system is a system who's, who, that has a lot of elements. That could be cars and traffic, it could be cells in the immune system, it could be uh, consumers or producers in an economy, and those systems are reacting to the overall pattern that the individual elements create. So there's a lovely feedback loop there. The elements, say cars, are creating something we can call traffic, and in turn they're reacting to traffic, but they're reacting to the pattern that the cars create. And I find that fascinating. It's, it's not that complicated, it's not hard to grasp. Complexity, I don't think is that well named. We should have called it interactive systems or something. <laughs> but it, it's fascinating in that you're always looking at elements that create some outcome. Those elements are in turn reacting to. And sometimes that's all in unison. Sometimes the reactions give you harmony and stasis and everything is very highly ordered and goes on pretty much forever. Other times you get uh, disruptions rattling across or propagating across the system. Sometimes you get new patterns forming. Let me give you a quick example here. Um, I arrived in Silicon Valley in uh, 1982. Earlier than that, I'd been in Berkeley in the uh, early 70s, late 60s. But I arrived back and I was in Stanford from 82. And you could say Stanford or Silicon Valley, that area in California, now called Silicon Valley, has a high-tech economy. And if you believe standard economics, you think, well, you know, the, that economy holds itself in balance, that there are so many companies competing that prices for transistors would emerge or computers or whatever they're making. But Silicon Valley consists of elements, the little companies, startups, big companies like Apple and Facebook, and these are always changing. And those change the landscape, and they form a sort of ecology among themselves. Facebook becomes an ecology for other startup companies, so does Google. Google may be the hope that a startup company has. You know, I start up some new app or some clever computerized or digital idea. I'm hoping maybe that Google will buy me out. That's so, all so, of our hopes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't mind Google buying myself out. <laughs> so anyway, but Silicon Valley isn't in equilibrium. It's seething with activity. And one of the examples I'm fond of using for complexity and the difference it makes from equilibrium, strange to say, I got fascinated by the sun. You know, Galileo points his telescope to the sun in 1610, and he sees this spherical uh, ball of fire. And from that distance, he, he discovers sunspots and a few imperfections, which is a bit shocking in 1610 for something that's supposed to be perfect. But <laughs> if you think about the sun, um, historically, if we stare at it, even with telescopes from afar, before we get a bit sophisticated and have really good telescopes, what you see is a big round mass or ball of fire that is holding itself in equilibrium. Gravitational forces holding all those um, elements of whatever they are, particles um, in the sun, atoms, particles of hydrogen, helium, etc. They're all held together in a big spherical equilibrium. But actually, if you look at it up close with a modern telescope, and particularly with X-ray types of telescopes, you don't see up close, you don't see a spherical sphere in equilibrium. The whole sun is seething and boiling with all kinds of things, mass plasma eruptions, 
X-ray, bright spots, X-ray, dark spots, magnetic loops. So mm. it's like the surface of water that's boiling. All that energy, of course, is coming from fusion, coming from deep inside the sun. But it comes to the surface and the whole thing is boiling away. So from one point of view to a first approximation, the sun is a big animal, a big creature, whatever, a big body that's in equilibrium, for close up, there's no equilibrium at all. All of this is seething and boiling and sending off mass plasma eruptions, etc., all the time. And the economy is a bit like that. From maybe afar, an economy looks as if it's in equilibrium, and maybe many parts of it haven't changed and aren't doing much for decades or centuries. Maybe the shoe industry and Italy in the 1800s, you know, didn't change that much in decades. Other parts of the economy are changing, and all the creatures in that, so the different firms are jockeying for position, and each is affecting each other. So that's the complexity point of view. Everything's so, changing. So a few things, cause, because I, I want to continue along that thread, because what you're really getting to there is also Joseph Schumpeter, Creative Destruction, and I really want to touch on um, some of the great work that was done by a lot of those thinkers before uh, the neoclassical models became sort of doctrine in economics. Also, I think it's really fascinating. I love how fascinated you are and how much and how passionate you are about this. I've, I've seen that in your in your talks, and I find it really refreshing and wonderful. Um, and I think telling also of not just your own passion, but also really the what, how, how much there remains to be discovered uh, in this field. Uh, a few things um, before we sort of uh, circle back and, and just close off a loop on some of the things you were saying with respect to, to uh, feedback, percolation, and, and some of those things. But uh, what, you're, what you're again touching on here is this, this concept of Newtonian mechanics, this idea that, uh, that existed, which or this hope that, again, the sun was in equilibrium. You're also getting to entropy, which I think is a fascinating thing. There is, uh, if we do have an opportunity, I do want to ask you how perhaps um, quantum theory uh, fits into into this whole notion of complexity. But uh, before, when when you were when you were speaking about uh, percolation, propagation, you're, you're really you're you're talking about positive feedback. I mean, some of these qualities: clustered volatility, uh, phase transition, uh, which I think you touched on, which is something I think is really fascinating, and I'd like to get to when we get to financial markets because I think that's a that's a very relevant point. I think it, it deals a lot with volatility and uh, and some of the things that we see in financial markets and particularly relevant today where we have such low levels of financial volatility. I do want to ask you about that. You're, you also, of course, were uh, touching on the notion of fractals and fractal geometry. And uh, and I think it's also interesting, you know, you talk about computers and how we had, pen, how we had pencils and papers and we developed computers. And of course, that was so essential to, to folks like Mandelbrot to be able to do their work because of the fact that they had to do these computational geometry. Um, so, so if we could now continue um, along the, the train of thought where you were going, you, it sounded like when you were talking about um, uh, Silicon Valley, you were talking about the economy there and this notion of, uh, of, uh, of equilibrium versus this creative, destructive, endogenously um, driven, uh, uh, changing environment. Um, could you continue along that thread? Uh, modern economic states, of course, you know, from the late 1700s, Adam Smith and others. But what interested those early economists was kind of two sides of the coin, two different problems. One is how are patterns, how do patterns come into equilibrium? You know, if England is trading with Portugal and usually buying Portuguese wine and sherry, and Portugal's buying English wool, England had loads of rainfall and grass and sheep, and Portugal had loads of sunshine and grapes and wine. So if countries are trading with each other, how does some sort of equilibrium arise? You know, how many... Uh, how much wool trades for how much uh, wine. And th these were what I would call problems of allocation. That's what they're called in economics. You know, how 
how are static patterns formed? And that's kind of the first question you would ask. And the answers that were given, I think, were pretty good answers in the 1700s and 1800s. All the really good economists, and I would say Adam Smith, Malthus, Ricardo, J.S. Mill, uh, Marx, and others, they, these were superb economists. And they all concerned themselves with those patterns of um, with how these patterns came into equilibrium, how they formed, and what sort of balances, what sort of allocations of goods and services were made between countries, within countries, even within um, uh, small regions or within firms themselves. And they looked at equilibrium economics. But these guys were also curious, and they looked at how did an economy form in the first place? Where did companies and firms come from? How did they form? How did trading arrangements form? And they had wordy explanations for this. In, in Karl Marx, um, in the 1850s and 60s, when he was writing, you know, how did power relationships form and how did they affect who got what in the economy? So you could say that up until 1870 or so, all the best economists were look, looking at two different things or two related things, what patterns might be in equilibrium in the economy and how could you describe those, but also how do things form in the economy, how do new structures form, how does technology, the coming of the railways, change an economy. So there are two different sets of problems allocation, if you want, and formation. And they were all treated by the same people, sometimes in the same books. Then 1870 arrives and people start to discover or bring into economics uh, in a serious way, algebra and calculus. And they discover that these trade patterns market prices, all those could be reduced to algebra and reduced to um, calculus and algebra if they were willing to make further assumptions that everybody was rational, that things were at equilibrium. So there was a little bit of a devil's price to pay. You could analyze an economy with mathematics and equations if you're willing to assume that all problems that everybody faced were well-defined, that people could algebraically or some other way come up with rational solutions, that patterns didn't change, and so we're back to the spider's web. <laughs> you know, Can we describe how the spider's web works if we know which points are connected to which points? And the answer is sure, we just write down all the equations and solve those. So one part of economics, this part that deals with who gets what, how trading patterns form, uh, how producers and consumers together arrive at a system of prices, how those prices don't vary much over years and years, uh, how one thing's valued in terms of another, all those equilibrium questions, those sorts of questions were mathematizable. And could Which is be allo allocation theory. Allocation theory. And the 20th century really went to town on allocation theory, so that by <laughs> about 1980, economics itself, if you talked about economic theory, you meant allocation theory. You, you meant things that could be expressed in equations. And theory, this is amazing to me, so I'm extremely or pretty highly trained in mathematics. I've graduate degrees in mathematics. So basically theory was taken as mathematics and economics was the result of solving all those equations. By the time I got through Berkeley, I thought economics was a bunch of theorems. I thought economics just consisted of mathematics. And in an early job, I was sent to Bangladesh, of all places. And uh, I, my mind was just blown by the fact that, you know, I couldn't see any mathematics to apply anywhere. That's very interesting. What, uh, what in particular... 
uh, the bazaars, the sort of uh, commercial atmosphere of the place? No, the commercial atmosphere might have fitted into this sort of mathematics. You know, if you had uh, woven silk or something in a bazaar, if you had rice being sold in bazaar, that might have prices that you could analyze by mm. mathematics. But in Bangladesh, they were getting constant flooding. They were getting constant change. Uh, economic development mm. was coming along slowly, and things were changing. And as things changed, other things changed. So bicycles might arrive. There weren't really roads in the country because it was extremely low-level land, and sometimes that land would flood. Land holdings were changing. The population was increasing. This was 1975, very, very rapidly. That meant the average size of farms was going down to, you know, from four hectares to two hectares to one hectare, etc. People were pushed to the edge. So the economy was always reforming itself, mm. and people weren't necessarily reacting rationally they were doing what any humans would do in a situation like that. They were trying to defend what they owned. They were trying to defend themselves from famine. They were holding off uh, disasters. They were flocking into the cities. So the situation was always changing. Let me go back to 1870 or so, if I may. About 1870, economics changed. The part that dealt with allocation, you know, the uh, what these patterns would look like, prices and the quantities produced, and um, what we'd call solutions to economic markets, um, that all came to be mathematized. And the other part of economics that dealt with, you know, where does an economy come from? How does an economy change structurally? When formation some, theory. That was all formation. And that couldn't be mathematized because new stuff, new things, things that you couldn't foresee, like the coming of railways, you couldn't have foreseen that easily in 1820. And the whole economy changed by 1850 in England, 1860. The railroads or the railways connected London to, to Bristol or London to Birmingham in four and a half hours. Beforehand, it might have taken horses and oxen to trans to transport stuff from Bristol maybe coming in across the Atlantic uh, to London so it could have taken a couple of weeks to to get your stuff so the whole economy changed it's questions of how does structural change work uh, how does the, an economy reform itself how does technological change work how do these disruptions ripple their way through the economy and propagate across the economy? Those couldn't be mathematized. So people like Schumpeter, who was fascinated by all these formation questions, Josef Schumpeter, came along. And the best Schumpeter could do, and in my opinion, real genius, Schumpeter, very, very uh, bright and imaginative, but the best he could do was to describe this in words. And the result, by a century or so later, you know, by uh, 18, 1970s, 1980s, when I was studying economics in grad school, was that Schumpeter was never mentioned. I never heard about Schumpeter in my studies in Berkeley. You'd have to have taken economic history or some arcane version of economics Schumpeter, of course, would have been taught in Germany and maybe even in England, but we weren't taught about Schumpeter. We were taught about all the allocation people. And wonderful economists like Schumpeter, uh, Thorsten Veblen, who concerned themselves with formation, how did things come to be? How did things come into being? How did the economy change? How did structures in the economy change? How did markets arise? Where did central banking come from? These people were called economic historians. They were literary. <laughs> they looked at specific examples. And the theorists uh, by the 1980s were all solidly based in, in mathematics. So was I. 
And we scorn these people as sort of not being able to do science. And without being able to do science, we, we had this superior feeling that we were the real scientists and that the people who looked at questions of formation were people who couldn't do science. But where does Friedrich Hayek fit, uh, fit into this? If you ask in the 20th century who were the top three economists in the world, I would have said <laughs> um, Schumpeter, uh, John Maynard Keynes, of course, and uh, von Hayek. Um, and notably, these people uh, didn't use that much mathematics. Some were trained. Keynes was quite highly trained mathematically. But the other two were less prone to uh, writing down mathematics. And Hayek, in particular, uh, was interested in problems we would now call information problems. Hmm. If you have a gigantic socialist economy, say like uh, the Soviet Union turned out to be, with all kinds of production capacity, they could produce thimbles, they could produce tanks, they could produce gardening tools, they could send uh, people into orbit, etc., how on earth does an economy like that um, balance itself or signal if it's the central government telling factories what they ought to produce at what prices? And Hayek started to look at that as a big information problem. You know, does some unit, some big factory system in Siberia, where does it get its signals from? not from consumers, not from people buying gardening tools or wanting a tractor, but uh, from some central committee in Moscow that may not know what problems that factory faces. And so Hayek began to appreciate, uh, the way I would put it about Hayek's work is that he really appreciated that a market system where prices were signaled, the price of haircuts uh, might affect some small town, and price of beer, the prices of steel, if it was a factory. All these prices are affecting other prices. Uh, I might buy less steel if I'm a car manufacturer. If the price of steel goes up, I might substitute something else, possibly uh, aluminum or something else, some other alloy, and cut back on steel if the price of steel goes up. So what Hayek appreciated was that you didn't have to have a central committee. You didn't have to have a big planning unit like later they had in China or they had in the Soviet Union telling people what to produce. That might be necessary in a war, Second World War, for example. But most of the time, a market could send these signals of prices. Mm. So if I, were, if I were, say, in Detroit, uh, there might be market signals coming out of Pittsburgh about what price they were willing to s sell me steel at, and I could react accordingly in Detroit. So the big insight of Hayek was that you didn't have to have planning committees, you didn't have to have all that information in somebody's head, you didn't have to load it into computers, and anywhere the information may be out of date or correct, you could let the market signal prices and signal information, and this would get you a far superior system. So Hayek, interested in an, just a pure information problem, turns out to be one of the gods of the market economy hmm. a, and is celebrated by the, the right to this day. But I think his insight was very sound, that the economy is a system, that information signaled across that system, and price information is really an efficient way to do that. And and of course, uh, and I couldn't agree with you more. And I think I agree entirely. The uh, his the his his dealing with the inform information the dis the information distribution problem. I think was um, certainly what I what I value most about him. His work on prices, and and of course that's that's also um, dealing directly with the nonlinearity component, which right. is that you could you could move a price a little bit in one place uh, and have a drastic effect across the economy. And I think 
classic case, classic example, are central banks, monetary policy, and the the law of unintended and unintended consequences uh, in that regard, which I would love to discuss with you as well. Um, and we can continue along that thread, or we can go back to Schumpeter and I think the business cycle, which is something that you were touching on. Um, either one is fine. I'd like to cover both of them, though, through the course of the interview. So I, I leave it up to you. All these questions of formation got left behind, and they were treated by what theorists would have called wordy economists, you know, people looking at historical cases, people writing histories of the railroads, or even history of turbine systems, histories of how the jet engine came to be. All of that was actually superb econ economics, but it couldn't easily be expressed in mathematics. You know, just figure it out. You're trying, you're writing a book about the birth of turbojets, the uh, the gas turbine jet engine. How on earth do you express that in equations? Yet that has done huge amounts to change economies. So of the railroads, so has the computer. So all these things are extraordinarily important, but they couldn't be put into equations. The whole question of how things formed, how structures changed, how all this upheaval happened was left to economic historians. And this is where Schumpeter comes in because that's the set of questions that fascinated Schumpeter. Schumpeter is always interested in how things form. How does change form? How does structural change happen? How does what we would now call technology, he called it the means of production, how does that form? How does that change? How does it change over time? And Schumacher was very much, he thought um, dynamically, he thought in things affecting things. So when a really new technology comes along, say computation, well, I should go back to a, a more technology of Schumpeter's time, when the railroads hit Austria in the, <laughs> in the late 1800s, Schumpeter was fascinated not just in how they changed the economy and how they opened up the economy from one end of Austria to the other, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire even. Schumpeter was fascinated about how they flattened many other industries, you know, horse drage, um, maybe some provincial stagecoach operations, and he saw this as a blast of wind. This Any new technology that was significant would be like a gale of wind blowing across the economy and flattening all kinds of structures that existed before. So Schumpeter was fascinated by this. Schumpeter called this gales of destruction. Not only would new inventions, new technologies bring construction, bring novelties, bring new creations, but it would flatten all kinds of old things that it displaced. It was this sort of formation that that fascinated Schumpeter. And Schumpeter wasn't mathematical. All his life he regretted that he wasn't particularly mathematical. Schumpeter was um Schumpeter was a sort of real world guy. You know, he was interested in history. He was interested in law. That's what he was trained in. And Schumpeter was always looking at real world cases. So there's kind of funny juxtaposition here. Schumpeter is describing economies as he sees them. He's a bit like a painter or more like a filmmaker who sees things changing in front of his eyes. And he's in his writings, he's kind of making a documentary film of how things are changing, how new things are destroying the old, etc. The theorists, in the meantime, are constructing a, a beautiful machine. You know, how does this part affect that part, and how does everything keep everything humming along in a sort of equilibrium? And the machine consists of equations. And the two sides, by about the 19... 60s, 70s, 80s, we're really not talking to each other very well. As I say, I got through grad school and quite a bit of what I studied there was economics. And I never heard of Schumpeter. I didn't hear Veblen. 
course, I knew those names, but I didn't hear of them in any of the classes I taught. What I did hear of were names like Samuelson and a mentor of mine, Kenneth Arrow. These were superb theoretical mathematical economists, Gerard de Breu, uh, who I knew, um, all Nobel Prize winners, of course, and but the wordy types uh, were not mentioned. I don't think this was a kind of disdain for them. It's just that they were held, ah, uh, they were held sort of not to matter as much. You know, rail economists, the rail guys did equations. We did mathematics. We did theory. Theory was mathematics, and we looked at allocation problems in equilibrium. The people who couldn't do that, who weren't trained, had to content themselves with how economies formed and changed and how structures changed and how new institutions, new laws, new legal systems, uh, new contractual systems grew and changed and fell away. So all of formation was kind of neglected. It I, I should say... Yeah, I should. I want to say also uh, to, and it's also sort of a question I have for you in this regard, because as I've as I've looked into this myself uh, as well, I think by mathematics and theory, what you're you're also saying is that you can equations, very specifically, that you could also find solutions, mathematical solutions to these equations, uh, which is something that um, that complexity d does not necessarily allow for. Uh, or rather, it recognizes that a solution is uh, is beyond uh, beyond your your capacity to lo to locate, despite for, despite the fact that a solu a solution is is potentially possible, mm -hmm. or rather that the, that the system has deterministic elements to it, but that they are so embedded in in what we would think of as noise. Perhaps I'm 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 misstating I'm misstating uh, this, but. Um, uh, yeah, I, that, I I fumbled that a little bit, but I, I I don't fully understand it, and it's something that fascinates me. This this idea, like I I also said in my in my uh, studies of information theory and, and cryptography, and and uh, and this this idea of the message and the noise, and and uh, and uh, and and, and a, num a normal number versus a number that uh, versus something that can that has a, a an algorithm that can be written for it. Um, you know, maybe you could explain that a little bit more. Also, that that uh, that that difference between having uh, equations that can be solved versus those that cannot be. So far, I've been saying that you know the allocation people, those theorists, nailed down all the problems of allocation, expressed that mathematically. They set all that up as mathematical problems that had mathematical solutions. You couldn't write the solutions down in economics, but you could write down necessary conditions. So you could write down a little cage that the animal had to be in, say, well, you know, solution has to have these properties, <laughs> it had, it, et cetera. So think of the whole mathematical system set of uh, systems in economics were problems with well-defined, pretty well-defined solutions. Complexity comes along, and more than anything, complexity concerns itself with problems of formation. Now we had computers, and we had, um, if you don't like computers, we had nonlinear dynamics, which I had been trained in, and we had probabilistic nonlinear dynamics, which also was a specialty of mine or is. Uh, stochastic process theory, all these uh, quite advanced techniques for looking at systems that are changing over time. And it might be a complicated system forming, you know, how do all the little units in the economy change when the steam engine comes along? You know, previous to that, in, I'm thinking of England in the 1800s, uh, companies, uh, um, Factories and mills had to be halfway up some mountain where there was a drop in water, maybe a waterfall that could turn the water mills, that could turn the machinery, etc. Once the steam engine comes along, they could be pretty well anywhere, and they were put down by the side of canals and rivers or uh, next to the railroads uh, because a steam engine can give you energy to run a mill just about anywhere. 
So all of those problems of the economy forming and reforming itself um, <clears throat> were problems uh, that standard equations couldn't look at, but complexity could. Because complexity says, okay, I'm going to look at all these little factories and mills and I'll have them as their own little computer programs within some larger program in the computer, or I can write dynamic equations for them if you still like equations, and <clears throat> we can <clears throat> allow these equations to unfold. So this computer approach or complexity approach by saying we're going to look at the whole system changing, we're not just going to look at, say, foxes and sheep or wolves and sheep and grass being in equilibrium, we're looking at what happens when there's a major change, say, when the grass dies and the sheep can't graze and suddenly there's big changes to the wolf population. So everything's affecting everything and everything's changing and maybe always changing. We could look at that on the computer. We could look at that with much more sophisticated mathematics, nonlinear dynamics, and we could describe that. So this has been a huge change in economics, and it doesn't really make sense from a standard theory mathematical point of view. So I want to dwell for a moment on the kind of horrors that gives a mathematical theorist. So if you think that economics consists of a bunch of mathematically described problems with precise algebraic solutions, then what we're looking at in from 1980s on, we're saying, oh, wow, I possess computers. I've got a really pretty good computer here. I'm going to look at all these little elements, put them model them in my computer machine and allow them kind of to fight it out and to come to outcomes or patterns that may never settle down. So I would certainly describe this as a paradigm shift. And one of the things that changes in a paradigm shift, as pointed out by Thomas Kuhn years ago in the 60s, is that the whole idea of what is a legitimate problem and what is a legitimate solution, those ideas very often shift. So you're saying now in economics, what's a legitimate problem? Well, problems of formation are just as legitimate now with computation or nonlinear dynamics as problems of equilibrium were. So we can say the economy is not in equilibrium. There's nothing in equilibrium in Silicon Valley, for example. Everything's changing. It's like an ecology where little companies are changing, becoming big companies. That sets the scene for yet further companies. Everything's affecting everything. Everything's changing all the time. And it's a scene of very rapid change with boiling with energy in Silicon Valley. So it's not an equilibrium. So we began to realize that if you're looking at problems of economic formation, you're looking at not so much at well-defined mathematical problems because the players in formation do not know the system that they're in. They don't know the precise details. They don't know what the government's going to do. They don't know what regulations are going to do. They don't know what their competitors are going to do. If I'm in Silicon Valley and I'm introducing some new artificial intelligence app or some autonomous system, I don't know who's doing what across the road. I don't know what their secret sauce is going to be. I don't know what they're going to launch. I have no idea how that will be received. We don't know the legalities or the regulations. I might be planning a system, say, for uh, fleets of trucks that are autonomous, thundering their way across Arizona autonomously. I don't know how the government's going to react. So it turns out that in these big questions of formation, the problems are not well-defined to the players in the economy. 
what do they do? Well, they're trying, their big problem is not so much to, to accord to some solution. Their problem is to try to make sense of the situation they're in. And they're exploring, they're trying new things, they're coming to realize their competitors have a different system, they're coming to realize that the technology they're developing is, isn't as good or as far better than they expected, and they're adapting and changing all the time. Mm. And that sort of adapting and changing means that they're not facing a well-defined mathematical problem. You know, they're not saying if we could only... Uh, figure out uh, mathematically how this or that works and come up with a solution, we'll be perfectly fine. They're saying, we don't know what the hell uh, system we're in. We're working in the dark. We're trying to do what we think is going to work out. Our competitors are as well. And everything's changing. Two years later, the game has changed. So it's more like trying this, trying that, knowing that your competitors are doing the same. That means that problems in the economy are not well-defined. And solutions, in quotation marks, are patterns. Solutions are no longer mathematical solutions. They're, they're not telling you exactly how the spider's web of equilibrium will settle out. They're saying that this is one thing happening after another. So problems cease to be well-defined, and outcomes are patterns. So from the previous point of view, problems in the economy can be well-defined by the players. They can be well-defined by economists, and solutions are mathematical um, and well-described. In the complexity version of the economy, problems are not well-defined, but we can define how people, how the players in the economy change, how they explore, how they adapt, and in adapting how they change the system, and we can look at the resulting patterns. So we're no longer looking for equilibrium solutions with a capital S. We're looking for changing patterns and how patterns change and how we describe those patterns and what sort of phenomena come up with those patterns. Um, this, so this is, I think, quite a challenging change in economics. It's not problem, mathematical problem, mathematical solution. It's a system where players are trying to make sense of what they're in. They're adapting, and that changes the system. Further adaptions are required. Maybe the system never settles down. And the new idea of the solution is to say it's a pattern that's always forming and reforming. It's so, so you're you're also essentially saying there, if I understand correctly, is there's an inexactness, but that inexactness is not synonymous with uh, ignorance or not not having any. You can get you can get your arms around the system, uh, but you can't get you can't understand it exactly. You don't know exactly that a if I do a, it will create b or c or or whatever, and that's part of the nonlinearity. You're also, of course, um, describing if I under if I'm if I if I. Uh, if I can say that, you're describing what is essentially the business cycle in economics as well, what produces the business cycle. And you're also describing, I think you're touching on something really wonderful that I want to follow up on, um, it, which is the the boom and the bust um, uh, and these, these cyclical patterns uh, that we see in markets, in financial markets. And uh, the 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 predictability that so often happens, um, the correlation that so often happens during uh, a period right before a phase transition in complex systems. Um, so you, you tend to see everyone moving in a market in the same direction right before a major shift occurs, uh, and there's a, a, a period of great volatility. Let me ask you uh, a bit more about this uh, because I, you know my my great fascination has always been um, or has for a long time been financial markets because it's such a rich it provides such a rich data set um and it and it is it very much in what you're describing it's very inductive people are constantly um coming to use a create a particular model 
which uh, you were touching on again before. You develop everyone's developing models that work. They work for a while, but as they as they seem not to work, they change. And when you have uh, enough people using the same model, you get high correlations. You get a lot of structure, and then. Uh, invariably, the endogenous uh, volatility of a system, of such systems, creates. Uh, and I think 1987, the crash in 1987, could could uh, could stand out as one of those moments where, regardless, it doesn't have to be exogenous. These systems are endogenously uh, uh, go through periods of chaos, um, at where everyone sort of has to vie for a new model, a new way of interpreting reality uh, before the system can, uh, you know, reset to a sort of a temporary um, place of, uh, of, of agreement. Talk to us a little bit about your, um, the way you view financial markets. And it'd be really wonderful to, to really, where I really like to take it is how you view them also in the context of, of current affairs in terms of what you've seen in your lifetime, uh, different crashes, certainly the, the panic of 2008. And, and I'd also like to get into your views and thoughts around building, because I, I love this. I mean, this is the other thing that really fascinates me personally so much about complexity uh, is this, this again, you've, you've got, you know, waves in the ocean. These waves um, uh, can create tremendous amounts of chaos if, uh, if you don't learn to ride them. And some people either drown in the waves or they try to build dams, and those dams aren't resilient. And, and I think complexity, for me, one of the ways I think about it is it's so much about learning how to, how to, how to coexist within those waves and within, um, within those forces. And, uh, and so when I think about regulation and when I think about monetary policy and fiscal policy, I like to think it in those regards. And I feel that uh, one of the things that we struggle with so much in, uh, in, uh, in policy today on a, for, to bring it into current affairs is that so many of the policymakers don't think in that regard. They think very much in, in trying to exercise a great deal of control over the system, and it doesn't provide that level of resiliency and flexibility. So I'd love for you to, 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 to tell us a little bit about how you see financial markets, how you see uh, current affairs, and what perhaps even ideas you may have for better ways of, of dealing with this stuff. Well, on my side, I can say it's a pleasure to talk to someone who knows an awful lot. So, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, um, yeah, so let let me uh, plunge in here. Um, I want to talk about a piece of work, actually, we did in the very early Santa Fe Institute, and uh, this had to do with financial markets. The, the standard theory, the standard economic theory of financial markets sees them as being, not surprisingly, in equilibrium. So... Um, you know, what neoclassical or standard economics asks is, you know, what would a stock market look like in equilibrium? That's called the problem of asset pricing. And maybe you imagine a firm and it's got a little stream of dividends or earnings and it's paying out something to its investors. And what uh, economists solved actually mathematically was in the 1970s and very beautifully solved with this problem of uh, if you had a certain stream of dividends, what would that, what price for the stock would that imply? And they solved it, I wouldn't say by cheating, but they solved it by a major shortcut. They said, well, we can't exactly imagine that everybody has different ideas, so we'll imagine that all the investors have the same ideas, the same forecasts, and we'll imagine those forecasts are something that we call rational expectations. Basically, the whole idea is that given the stream of dividends, we imagine that all the investors come to the same conclusions, and they know that other investors come to the same conclusions. And given the stream of dividends, uh, they all imagine that that implies as prices that may go up and down with the dividends or the earnings, uh, but those prices will be um, in rational expectations equilibrium, meaning the prices you see on the actual market over time will on average uh, mimic or be or roughly statistically in harmony with the prices they forecast. So let me say this a bit more intelli intelligibly. 
the standard model assumes investors uh, that are all alike and that they know that other investors are just like them. And those standard investors have to have little kind of forecasting machines as if the earnings are such and such. Here's what that will do to the prices. Earnings are announced. Uh, they forecast prices. They buy in or sell in the market, and certain prices are realized. And if, if over time those prices realized uh, are pretty much the same statistically as the prices that were forecast, then that's called stochastic equilibrium. Now, that was well solved in economics and, you know, pretty much a Nobel Prize was given to Bob Lucas uh, for solving that and well-deserved, if you ask me. And, um, but around 1988, we came along. Oh, and by the way, the, that uh, solution was wonderful. You get, uh, if you plot the solutions mathematically, they look just like real market data. <laughs> And everybody stood up and cheered and said, this is wonderful. But there was something embarrassing about it. In actual markets, as you mentioned, in actual markets, there are correlations, volumes correlated with prices. There's auto-correlations. What you get tomorrow might persist if the market's going up. It might go up further. There's little bubbles and crashes, and sometimes very large bubbles and very large crashes that are unexplained. So there's, there, there are um, periods of very high volatility randomly followed by periods of low volatility that persist for a long time. None of that should be present or was present in the standard solution. So around 1988, John Holland and myself, John's a great um, theorist in computer science, died a... a a couple of years ago, and some other, um, uh, John Holland, Richard Palmer, physicist, Blake LeBaron, myself, and um, Paul Taylor in London, who worked in the city uh, in finance, we, uh, we got up a different study. Our idea was to say, well, hang on, we've got computers now, it's 1988, and we're going to imagine that <clears throat> we have little investors. The little investors are going to be uh, little computer programs within our machine. We can have 10,000 of those if we want, and we can allow them. We're not going to say they have a perfect mathematical model uh, that they can solve in advance. We're going to say they're just blundering along, and they're trying to form hypotheses uh, ideas about how the market works, and we'll allow them to differ, and we'll allow them to start with pretty random hypotheses, and if those hypotheses don't make money, then they'll throw them away and replace them maybe with ones that improve over time. They'll keep the good ones at work, but they don't have to be the same as anybody else. So we cooked up our model that was identical to the neoclassical one, except that our investors weren't perfectly rational, they weren't perfectly well-informed, they weren't identical, <laughs> they differed, and they could blunder their way into the market and get smarter and smarter. And what would happen? Well, lo and behold, uh, we did see the standard solution. We thought maybe that's all there is. You know, our market, when we finished up in the computer, our market looked like real markets. It looked like the neoclassical solution. But when we looked a bit further, we saw little bubbles and crashes. We saw periods of random volatility that was high, followed by periods of volatility that was low. We saw all the same autocorrelations and cross-correlations that you'd see in real markets. So it's a bit like going back to the sun. The previous theory had said, you know, the sun is in equilibrium, the, the market is in equilibrium. What would that look like in the case of the market? But we were showing all the little... 
uh, mass plasma ejections, all the forming magnetic loops that would form and affect other loops and fall away. We were showing that uh, like in real markets. And this piece of work, I think, was a little bit complicated. So the press didn't pay as much attention to that as I expected. But basically, in our model and in our computer model, we were able to show all the phenomena of rail markets, whereas the previous theory uh, didn't. And why? Um, let me take one of the things, volatility. Suppose some of our little guys, our little agents, artificially intelligent in the computer, suppose it's all going along our stock market in the computer with our artificially intelligent little agents, their programs in the computer, all trading with each other and the price forms. And suppose that's reasonably at equilibrium, nothing much is happening. Then somebody discovers a much better way to forecast, a better way to beat the market because our little agents in the computer can can explore, they can change, they can see what works and what doesn't work from the patterns that they're paying attention to. And lo and behold, they they um, change what they're doing. That changes at a micro level the market. Maybe these agents that make the change are, are quite well off, so maybe that affects the market. Suddenly the market character has changed. The market psychology, you could say, has changed within our little machine, within our computer. And other agents then have to change too because what they were doing previously doesn't work. So it's a bit like an earthquake system. Uh, I make a change. I'm, I affect the market in a fairly small way, but that might make changes that tumble across the system, that propagate across the system, then everybody has to start changing because the old methods don't work any longer. The market's changed a bit, and suddenly everybody's changing. Prices then become quite volatile as people are changing their behaviors. And then after a while, some new quasi-equilibrium uh, comes about and settles down again, and that kind of volatility disappears. But this exists everywhere. I mean, certainly I was laughing when you were thinking, I was laughing to myself when you were saying it. I was thinking just simply about uh, 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 the guy who has the coffee shop right outside my apartment, and he's always complaining to me how uh, people will come in, and uh, when he's got muffins out, they uh, they don't take a muffin, then he has to put them away. And But he's constantly taking muffins out, putting them back in, you know, playing around with his, with his design. He's constantly changing his models. That's a very very volatile environment that he he has. Or I think of, uh, uh, for example, my father who recently moved, my parents who recently moved to a new apartment, and the traffic situation was very different there. And it took uh, a number of months for my father to become accommodated to the traffic and decide, you know, what he, for a week or two, he would wake up at 6, then he would wake up at 7, then he would go back to 6.30. And he was constantly discarding market uh, models trying to change and adapt. And, uh, and of course, some people simply want to change... Uh, uh, and try something new on their own without any particular reason whatsoever. And all these actors are within this this very complicated soup of a market, and their actions are affecting other people's actions. And so it it, it there's this I think that captures the endogenous uh, volatility of uh, of complex systems. I think so. I think that's precisely the case. Um, what what we see in general, and by the way, what I'm saying about stock prices. Uh, applies to oil prices, you know, in markets, it applies to commodity prices, etc., that uh, people might have models in their mind, little hypotheses or ideas of how uh, oil prices are forming and what the Saudis are about to do or the people in Russia and how uh, how that's going to affect the market. Maybe that doesn't happen. Maybe they have to change their behavior. So, Markets are not static affairs. They're not things that are at equilibrium um, that much. They're very much people adjusting. But those adjustments and explorations and little experiments like the guy with the muffins, 
that changes the market, even at a kind of micro level, and then that might cause further changes. So the very changes that agents are making, that investors are making, may change the market so that further changes are necessary. And a system like that, by its nature, is always sort of bubbling and boiling and never quite settling down. The um, And changes are rippling or propagating across the system. So to come to 2008, the interesting thing is that, let's say, it's just before 2008 and just before the uh, Lehman Brothers episode and uh, uh, if if I get it right, AIG and Correct, all, yes. and the other. <laughs> so just before the Lehman Brothers episode, AIG, et cetera, Paulson and others uh, intervening. So let's say we're in a market situation. Things are kind of more or less in a relative equilibrium. You know, um, derivatives are being <laughs> bought and sold and uh, housing uh, loans are being made in a very dubious situation, but things are roughly at, uh, not in perfect stasis, but in a kind of bubbly equilibrium up and down. And then something intervenes. Somebody says, hang on a moment, the emperor doesn't have as much clothes as we thought here, or whatever happens, and certain events trigger a situation, uh, I remember watching Iceland very closely in October uh, 2008, where suddenly what had happened actually in Iceland was a, a, a group of MBA people who had come back to Iceland <laughs> with their MBAs <laughs> from America uh, decided that they could buy up the assets of the three banks in Iceland, and they did. And they started to take investors or consumers, bank customers' deposits and play in the property market with those deposits. Properties suddenly collapsed and the banks collapsed. People lost uh, their very deposits. The state had to intervene. And so the whole thing was a, a shambles. What happened in America was that things went wrong. So certain companies started to collapse. Confidence in the derivatives started to collapse. Uh, people started to see the real value. There was a bubble that happened. People started to say, are these things really worth, stocks worth these prices? Um, and suddenly uh, expectations collapsed. Uh, certain Companies that had investments and banking companies collapsed. Memorably, the Lehman Brothers collapsed. And the government decided, well, we're going to make an example. We're not going to come in and save all these large companies. So that led to further collapses. AIG, if I remember, uh, collapsed. Prices collapsed. So it's like, again like earthquakes. It's um, failure and difficulties or stresses propagated across the whole economy, one thing causing the collapse of the next. So this wasn't a system at equilibrium. This was a system in which one part of the network was bringing down the next part of the network, which brought down the next part of the network. And things more or less evened out when the Actual values, which may not have been that wonderful, reflected were reflected in market values, and an awful lot of assets started to look like junk because rather stupid loans were given out. I'm curious because you obviously are familiar with the crisis. You've 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 uh, you paid attention clearly during that period. Um, what do you think? How do you see the contribution of monetary policy? and the setting of interest rates very specifically um, to this? And how does that fit in with your sort of view of the economy and the finan and financial markets as complex systems? And in particular, also 
we could bring it back to the information problem of Hayek and prices uh, and the setting of the risk-free rate. How do you see that? Uh, what's your, do, you have, do you have any views on that at all? I, <clears throat> I have some views. Uh, you, you can judge later whether, <laughs> whether they make any sense or not, because this isn't the area of economics I feel I know best. But let me give you some views anyway. If you see... Um, if you see the market as being in equilibrium, so the old way of looking at the economy, uh, everything's more or less in equilibrium, uh, people are rational, everything's well behaved, then uh, perhaps you can adjust interest rates, you can affect markets, you can affect housing prices, you can affect um, uh, loans uh, via interest rates, and if you're a monetary authority, you can adjust things and pretty well forecast how markets will adjust. And maybe that works quite a bit of the time. However, uh, if you are in a situation, and the real situation, I believe, is where there's a network of investors, and the decisions and beliefs of some are affecting the market, and other investors then have to change, and people are always adapting and exploring, then um, maybe you need, in addition, some other policies. So let me give you an idea. In Go back to 2008, and you can say, well, uh, maybe there's nothing we can do. Maybe the system is prone to these big collapses. Is there anything we can do? And what could you say from a complexity theory point of view? What I would point out is that Banking systems and uh, specifically investment banks, consumers, and so on, investors, uh, but particularly the banking system, over a period of time before that, uh, became not so much independent banks, not uh, separate entities, but they became a network of um, banks lending to other banks, banks heavily interwoven on the balance sheet of other banks. So there was a system of, um, I will give you credit and you give other people credit, and a, a cascading system of banks that were connected in their, um, in their debts and credits to other banks, and the network began to become very, very closely interwoven. So in other words, the banking system, rather than being an awful lot of dominoes that stood alone, started to be a set of dominoes that were set up, maybe not in a straight line, but set up close together, so that if one domino failed, it would bring down a whole bunch of dominoes. The propagation aspect the prop fits very well right there. In your, you bet. In your point. So what you could do as a monetary authority, or at least as, an author as a governmental authority, and let's take things out of the U.S. now and just say we're looking at Europe, we're looking at China or Iceland or anywhere else. What could you do in general? Well, you could set things up so that you're aware that all the dominoes are now standing a lot closer, or you could say there's more dominoes, and you could be very aware of what could bring down what else. It's not that hard. You can look at balance sheets, you could do stress testing and so on. And then you could say, well, hang on, we're going to make sure that this system maybe carries further reserves, or there's some rules where the whole system isn't going to bring down, you know, two or three major elements of that system um, bring down something that they're not going to collapse the whole system. Personally, I think that this is not that much different from uh, the an economy or a governmental system saying, look, you know, this is an earthquake zone, and we're going to make sure that one part of the system doesn't collapse here. San Francisco, parts of San Francisco are built on, on sand, on silt, and those are dangerous, so we need to have certain building codes there. We have codes about flooding. We, If some part of a city like New Orleans floods, we don't want that to spread to other parts. So we have 
rules and regulations that are tested over time. We have an air traffic system. We know if part of that system goes down, it may affect some other part. So we have rules and regulations for that. We have regulations about aircraft maintenance. What is it in the name of God that is so holy about financial systems that we dare not touch them? Uh, I'm not saying they should be laden down with regulations. I'm just saying that we should have some earthquake prevention um, rules. What you're really uh, getting at is, is something that was uh, largely in place before before 1998, which was Glass-Steagall, yes. which was this, this firewall uh, and this notion, this recognition that financial networks are networks and that uh, building firewalls, building... Um, separating them in some some ways the same way that when you have an oil tanker, you don't have uh, one giant open space under the tanker because if one area gets uh, is uh, is broached, if you have a break into in part of the hull, it doesn't result in a flooding of the entire of the entire of the entire hull. Um, in the interest of time, I don't want to I don't want to um, go over, and I know you're you're busy. I, uh, I wanted to see if we could just touch on that notion of quantum theory and information theory. Uh, if we had if we had a chance, I also want to say to our audience, early on in our discussion, you mentioned Thomas Kuhn, and of course, you were referring to uh, it, or either indirectly or directly st- the uh, structure of scientific revolutions, an amazing book, and I'm going to put that in uh, in the reading list for our audience uh, on my website after after this episode, uh, so everyone should go look for that. Uh, but. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Again, you know, I, I understand it's not your area of expertise, quantum theory and physics, perhaps, but uh, I'd love to hear how you feel that that all kind of comes together. Because when I, um, you know, for me, I didn't, I didn't, and I imagine for you as well. This is how I've, I've, I sort of have come to see this this um, area of complexity science. It seems that people sort of just found their way into it, and uh, that certainly was the case for me. I, I, I found my way into it through. The study of various various subjects, whether it was physics, theoretical physics, quantum theory, whether it was information theory, cryptography, and so I'm just curious, kind of, how do you integrate those things into your your view, um, given given your study of this field for so long? Sometime around the 1960s, 1970s, at least when I was studying as a student, uh, we certainly had a theory or. I wouldn't say a theory. We had a point of view in science where uh, everything could be mathematized, where the world was basically very highly ordered. Uh, it was, it was a, an optical illusion, it turned out, where economies were in equilibrium, where the theory should be an equilibrium theory. And then somewhere in the corner of the space of all economies. There were ones that were a bit out of equilibrium. Uh, over in the corner, there were exceptions. There were things that affected things that weren't in the market and all this sort of thing. So there were exceptions that where life got a bit, a bit wild. And we began to realize, and this is what complexity theory has done for us, and chaos theory, I suppose, which I think you know loads about, and nonlinear dynamics and computer science, we've begun to realize that highly well-behaved systems, highly ordered systems, are not that prevalent. And we tend to try to build (laughs) systems that are very highly ordered, and we treat them as uh, the norm. They're not the norm. You have to work pretty hard to have a system that's very highly ordered that can persist for years and years. And if you find something persists for years and years, say like the Christian church or something, you will discover that it's changed fundamentally at different times to adapt to different situations. So the norm is not one of high order. And I'm a big fan of uh, an American architect called Robert Venturi, who didn't like highly ordered architecture. And he said he wasn't an admirer of what he called prim dreams of pure order, you know, the work of Le Corbusier, 
or the Bauhaus, you know, these very geometrical buildings. Mm. Venturi rails against prim dreams of pure order, which I think we have in the economy, and says he's on for messy vitality. In other words, <clears throat> go back to the teenagers, complexity science as a whole is beginning to realize that the world is fairly well ordered, but shows signs of a lot of vitality. Just like the teenage years, most kids go to school, most of them can drive cars and they're not out of control, but occasionally the system needs to readapt readjust and it's full of vitality new things are arising everything's always in formation everything's changing one thing is changing another and basically it's a question of constant adaptation and constant change that's what complexity is showing us whether it's in physics whether it's in economics or whether it's in mm. God knows what, geology, and we're learning a lot from that. There's something very beautiful, and it expresses itself in that, in that manner. The, the complexity is itself something very beautiful. I think, uh, you know, I think also, again, uh, much of what um, I, I know about this field came from my studying of information theory, and there's something really, um, uh, something deeply interesting about uh, a system that is sufficiently complex so that it is not perfectly knowable, but not so complex that it is chaotic. Yes, um, and it, it, you know, jazz is very beautiful, and it's a very it's very complex. Whereas uh, you know, the percussion drumbeat of a, of a military parade is uh, is very simple. Um, and uh, not interesting and uh, not particularly beautiful. And so I think, you know, that's interesting to me that these subjective measurements like beauty and, and the notion of something being interesting um, coincide with uh, these, these, this theory. I think that's also something really, really fascinating to me. I th that's what I wanted to say. I think that's extremely well said and... I would applaud all that, certainly. I think you're absolutely on target. So let, let me say the same thing in my own language, but I'd, I'm just echoing what you're saying, that what we're learning is that there are quite highly ordered systems, <clears throat> and there are systems, uh, for example, perhaps certain aspects of classical music are very highly ordered, and... Then there are things that are totally and utterly random. And there are people who don't like randomness at all. I'm, I, I'm not a big fan of randomness, but I'm not a big fan of, of highly ordered systems. I grew up in Northern Ireland. It was a very highly ordered society. Uh, parks were closed on the Sabbath day. Uh, swings were chained. <laughs> Uh, shut on a Sunday in case anybody could get in over the wall of a park and, and take pleasure on a swing. So that sort of order just makes me grit my teeth. It's like living in some Calvinist paradise, uh, God knows, in Switzerland or somewhere. Uh, I, sh I should be more careful what I say. It's like... It's, like, <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Okay. I don't like highly ordered systems, and I think that people who are attracted to complexity and to really studying complexity uh, are very much people who like this balance between order and chaos. We're discovering mm. in complexity, and this goes to uh, quite a bit of work in complexity and in information theory, and I'm thinking of... Um, I'm thinking of Steve uh, of Wolfram, Stephen Wolfram's work, mm. Greg Chaitin's work, and others. They're showing that there are chaotic systems where one thing's affecting another, so interconnected and fast that that system is just always boiling and raging, and there's nothing ever settles down, nothing you can do with it, and you can't propagate information of that information is ad adapted to, destroyed, and further adaptations and further explorations. Nothing, no information can be propagated. 
On the other hand, if systems are frozen, if they're too ordered, like, say, a river in the dead of winter in Siberia, and that river is frozen, there's nothing that happens at one bank that could be easily propagated to another, at least within the river. It's, the whole system is frozen. All of life happens in between order and chaos. Mm. And this is where information can be propagated. And we find, as human beings, we're living in this world between order and chaos. It's exactly as you said, um, jazz in particular, improvisation, lives in this world. We sense the order, but a good um, improvisational uh, musician, whether it's in jazz or some mm. other uh, we'll play upon what we're expecting and what the order is, but they're not chaotic. They're showing you a new pattern, and after that, a yet another new pattern. They never may never repeat themselves from one performance to another. But this is what it means, in my opinion, to be alive. It's mm. not that you want everything ordered and perfect. It's <laughs> what you're looking for, and you don't want it too wild. Um, you know, I lived in Berkeley in the late 60s. <laughs> no, thank you. You don't want everything too wild and out of control. But what you're ideally looking for is situations that are always changing, and you're always adapting, and you're always alive in that sense. I remember early in the 70s, I kept a surfboard in Hawaii, and I'd go there quite often. And <laughs> you had a tough life. <laughs> oh, it was dreadful. <clears throat> and I remember, in, but I learned a lesson from surfing: no wave is ever the same as a previous wave. So mm. you're always you're trying to stay in the green water. You're trying to stay in clear water, not where the wave has tumbled over into white froth, that doesn't work. So you're always adapting, the waves always going different places, different waves are affected by previous waves, and you're adapting and changing and adjusting. And I think that's what it means to be alive, and I think that's what makes life worth living and what life, why life is always endlessly fascinating. You think you've mastered something, and then something totally unexpected comes up. So, well, I, yeah. Uh, no, I was going to say. I think. I mean, I think that that's an excellent. Uh, that's an excellent point to end on. Good. I mean, that's very, very beautifully said. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, so, Professor, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking so much time, being so generous, generous with your time. Um, and sharing your time with me and with our audience. I really do appreciate it. Well, and thank you, because it's, uh, for some complexity, it's pretty rare to, uh, you know, to meet an interviewer that's that, that well-informed. As I say, I looked at your webpage, and it's clear you've talked to quite a few people in this area, and it's clear it's a, it's a whole area that fascinates you, so I'm delighted. And that was my conversation with Dr. Brian Arthur. I want to thank Dr. Arthur for being on my program. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Connor Lynch. Sound engineering credits also go to Connor Lynch. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforcespod.com. Join the conversation on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforcespod.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.